Hello, thank you for um, joining me today. So today's section, we're gonna be talking about pressure reducing stations, and we're gonna talk about building them better and smarter. Um, one of the things we're not gonna be doing in this section though is cuckooing or saying that your pressure reducing stations are done. We wanna talk about how we can improve your stations, how we can improve and make sure we have all the functionality you need, and then maybe even add some smart features to it. So without delay, let's get started with building better, smarter pressure reducing stations. Thanks. Excellent. So let's talk about how to make a better, smarter pressure reducing station. And the way that we're going to talk about that today is that we're going to cover a few different topics. We are going to talk about Simcoe and GC Systems and Clayval and kind of our background, where we're coming from. We'll talk to of a quick review about control valves and how they work and their basic functions. And um, if you want to know more about that, we do sections that are entirely devoted to the basic hydraulics and maintenance of control valves, like the one that we had earlier during this conference. Then we'll talk about the different components of a pressure reducing station, what the parts are inside them and what those parts do. And finally, we'll talk about how to build a smart pressure reducing station. And if we have some time, we'll talk about how to build resilience into those pressure reducing stations and how to keep our control valves from closing. But first, a little bit about where we're coming from. So Simcoe GC Systems is a founded company in partnership between Simcoe and GC Systems boast manufacturer representatives in the Pacific Northwest. And GC Systems has been the manufacturer representative for clay valve for the last 40 years. And inside um, in our internal staff, we have over 80 years of experience with um, clay valve and with control valves. Like uh, if you ever worked with Carol Wells, oh, she is a hoot and she knows her stuff. Uh, we're located in Puyallup, Washington. And uh, you can see there in the picture of our little office there. And we have um, local technical support and service to help you guys with maintenance and troubleshooting and startups. We do phone support and system design consulting. And we are the only factory, factory authorized service team for Clayval in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. And there at the bottom, you can see some of the other lines that we represent, such as Valmatic, specialty valves, safety cover, and pump tech. Uh, we support the region with you know, primarily doing engineering and design support to make sure you get the right valve in the right spot with the right features. And we do that with our outside support team going out and visiting sites, going and visiting engineers and water districts, as well as our in support side support team who can help um, if you have a question about your clay vial, a question about parts that you need, or if you're having troubleshooting issues, give our office a call and we can walk you through those things and make sure you can uh, get the right parts and pinpoint where the issue may be. In addition, we have our field service department. So we've got our technicians out running around the state making sure, or not just the state, but the region, making sure all those valves are running well. And we keep local inventory of parts, pilots, and valve bodies through 8-inch at our shop. Um, we are not the main distribution point for these parts. Um, if you have large, you know, regular orders, you're going to want to go through your local supply house. But if you need a couple pieces and you need them right away, we have local inventory and we can ship them to you. So a little bit about Clayval, if you're not familiar. So Clayval is, has over 80 years of experience with clay with control valves, and this is you know around 1950 in their shop, um, and here this is them today. And they've really grown over the last 80 years, and their valves have changed quite a bit. This is one of the first um, valves that was patented in 1940 by Donald Griswold, and you know since then they have been developing new features, new um, valves, and new applications. And they're based down in Costa Mesa, California. They have locations around the world. And there is Mr. Donald Griswold on the left. And Clayval is still held privately by the Griswold family. And being a privately held company affords them the ability to do things that some um, publicly held companies can't do, like hold on to um, a good amount of inventory and be able to support the market through that. Founded in 1936 and based down in that facility in Costa Mesa, they have one generation of valves. So that valve that you saw there earlier was slightly different, but it's the same generation. And so we can go back and use our parts and pieces on valves that go back 50, 60 years. And they are the preferred brand worldwide with control valves. 
They also have a foundry down in Costa Mesa where we, they can pour 55 different metals and alloys. And they do castings um, for our own valves as well as other companies. And we do also casting for our parts and some of our pilot features. And because of that, we can do AIS um, full compliance. And if you have a special application and you need some different type of valve, they can do that as well. They have locations around the world to support the global market. And they're involved in waterworks, but it's not just waterworks. So here, you know, there's our familiar blue valves in the water world, but they also do red fire protection valves. They do industrial applications, a lot of times stainless steel valves, mining oil and gas, commercial fueling systems. And so now you're talking, you know, fueling valves and military grade fueling. And there is a nozzle that they make for some of their valves to be able to fuel, you know, that F-16 back there. Uh, we do marine applications and that's, you're talking, you know, bronze or nickel alloy bronze valves for seawater applications. And they're used all over the place. So some of the most recognizable landmarks in the world have clay valves in their system, um, including the Freedom Tower One which has over 100 in the fire protection and the domestic water system. And if we get a chance here as we're coming out of COVID and hopefully things are gonna to start to lift and you're interested, it is a really great experience to go down to the factory and see them pour um, and see them assemble these valves and how they do it. And they do trainings and factory tours. And you know, once things start to return to normal, we'd love to schedule some of those out. And if you're interested, um, let us know and, see, and we can see if we can get it scheduled. All right, now on to the meat of our class. So we're gonna talk about some basic principles of control valves. Uh, this is meant to be a quick refresher. We're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about all the details. This is just gonna be, make sure we're all kind of on the same page and jog your memory a little bit. So pressure or control valves are used throughout water systems. They're used for pressure control, flow control, level control, surge control, pump control, check valves, electronic control. I mean, there's a lot of different things that we can do with these valves. They're very versatile. Um, during this class, we're gonna be touching mostly on pressure reducing and pressure sustaining. And then when we talk about smart, we're gonna kind of get into a little bit of flow control as well. Uh, those other types of valves though, we can cover in other classes. And if you guys are interested in you know, these conferences, we try to tailor the classes for what people are really interested in. Um, oftentimes we don't do them on pump control valves or surge control or, you know, check valves because that's not what people are usually um, what they're working with every day. But if you're interested in learning more, please let us know. We can schedule a class for that. All right, here we go. It's a good little control valve, something that um, nice and shiny. And that right there is a con hydraulic control valve. And that control valve is made of three main areas. There's the main valve body which is that the body piece as well as the cover and the cover bolts. There, there's the disc and diaphragm assembly that goes inside that body and that's what's moving up and down to open and close the valve. And then there's the pilot control system which goes on the outside and that is what we're gonna use to move water around onto the cover and off of the cover in order to open and close the valve. And here you can see just kind of the basic parts of it. Uh, the main valve body itself, really not too complicated. It's gonna open up and it's gonna close. And when you have water flowing in, it'll push up on that inner valve assembly and flow water through. And this is our standard flow of water where we're gonna go up and over the seat. And it's a standard flow. We can do reverse flow under um, different applications, but this is generally how we're gonna flow water through the valve. Some of the principles of operation here is that if there's no water in the cover, there's no pressure in that cover, then when the water flows through this valve, it's gonna push that inner valve assembly up out of the way and then flow through the valve. Uh, that valve seat there is sized to be the same as the flange sizes so that it's not, um, it's unobstructed and we can get full flow through the valve. Conversely, if we put pressure onto that cover, then that will push down on the inner valve assembly and it'll push the valve closed drip tight. And then if we can balance the pressure in that cover with the pressure in the line, then we can balance that inner valve um, assembly and make it hold a position. And that's what we call modulation. So modulating control is when our valve is gonna sit somewhere between open and closed, and it's gonna adjust its position based on the modulating control. Oftentimes the hydraulic pilot in the pilot system, or it could be electronic solenoid pilots in the pilot system that are letting water on and off that cover to balance it. And here we can see an animation of this all in work. So we'll get a little cutaway here of the valve and then a cutaway of that inner valve assembly. 
And then we can see that if we take all water pressure off that cover, when water flows into the valve, it'll open it up. And then if we put the water onto the cover, it will close that valve by pressurizing that cover. And here we can see it with some water. So we're going to let that water off the cover. The water in the line is going to push the inner valve assembly up and flow through the valve. If we direct that water from inline upstream into the cover, we'll pressurize the cover, closing the inner valve assembly, closing the valve. The way that this works and the magic of this valve is through a difference in surface areas, creating a hydraulic advantage. So if this is a two and a half inch valve, the valve seat would have about six inches squared of surface area. If we have 100 PSI of water, that's pounds per square inch, coming through this valve, then that translates to 600 pounds of force pushing up on that inner valve assembly. That will push the valve open and flow water through it. If we direct that 100 PSI into the cover, inside the cover chamber, the inner valve assembly on top has a bigger surface area than down at the bottom at the seat. In this example here with the two and a half inch valve, there's 10 inches of surface area or a little over three inches of um, diameter of surface area on the top of this inner valve assembly. Because of that, the 100 pounds per square inch on the top translates to 1,000 1, pounds of force. 1,000 pounds on the top, 600 pounds on the bottom, we're gonna push down and we're gonna close this valve all the way and it's gonna be a drip type seal. Um, one of the beauties of that, this here is that this is a proportional force. We're using the water pressure against itself. So if we have 100 PSI, we have 400 pounds of closing force. That's the difference. If we had you know, 300 PSI, we would have 1200 pounds of closing force. We would have so much more force to close the valve. Even though there's 300 pounds pushing it open, we're going to use that same 300 pounds of larger surface area to push it closed. All right, so that's the basic main valve, and that was really quick. There is quite a bit more to it that we could talk about, um, you know, and we do talk about in some of our other classes, but let's move on now to pilot systems. So the pilot system is what's on outside of the valve, and the pilot system is what is going to tell the valve to open and close. It is what is directing water on and off the cover in order to open and close it. Uh, we have a lot of different features that go into these um, pilot systems. So we have hydraulic pilot valves like the CRD, the CRL, the CRA, the CDS6A, the CDS7, all these different valves in the pilot system that are going to control our valve opening and closing. We're going to move that water through 3 8 pilot tubing on its most standard size valves, and usually that's copper. We can also do stainless steel, and you've also seen probably plastic out in the field as well. Their standard is brass fittings, but we can also do stainless steel fittings. And so that's all about moving that water on and off the cover. In addition, some other features we can add in there is strainers to make sure nothing gets clogged. Speed controls to control the speed and the movement of water, which controls the movement and speed of the valve. Position indicators to let us know how open or closed the valve is. We can also add check features to make our valve a check valve. And all these are made using the connections on our valve body. So our valve body has connections on the inlet side of it, onto the cover and on the outlet side. And we're gonna use those in order to move water on and off the cover. Little pop quiz here that we, we do lots of times, and I think we do it in our other class that we had in this conference as well, is kind of how many different pilot control configurations do we have? How many are there? You know, we've got pressure reducing, pressure relief, uh, altitude, uh, that's three. But the way the clay valve does it is that it gets much more specific. And when you start combining valves, then you can do, you know, you can do one multiple functions with the same valve. And so the answer is 33,000. <laughs> that's how many different valve configurations that um, clay valve has on file that they do. And the reason is, is because you get valves kind of like this one that I was visiting um, a few weeks ago, where we've got four different um, hydraulic pilots on there, a couple different um, small hydro hydro valves, a couple solenoids, a check feature. Um, this valve is doing a lot of different things. And what that might look like in a schem schematic is something like this, where we've got just kind of lines everywhere, got a couple main you know, solenoids on there, a bunch of different hydraulic pilots, they're all doing different things, and they're all working together to tell this valve when to open and close. And each of those pilots is telling it to open and close at a different time, and the solenoids can make it open and close as well. And we can get more in depth into that in a full electronics class. Um, today, we're not going to talk too much about that. But let's talk now about pressure reducing stations. So when we have a pressure reducing station, they come in a lot of different flavors. Um, sometimes they look like this. 
you know, this is what you want to see. Open up those hatches and then boom, got a nice, you know, got a couple of valves there, got a bunch of gate valves. I have even got some pressure gauges. I've got some strainers, you know, you climb down in there and you can eat your lunch down there and stuff. It's nice. Um, sometimes also we see like this here where we got a valve buried in dirt. Um, this is technically still a pressure reducing station. Uh, the water's coming through this valve, it's reducing the pressure, it's going out at a different PSI. Um, it's not so much of a station as just a single valve, but I mean, it can match the description. And so that being said, there's a lot of different variances and a lot of different features that are added to pressure reducing stations. So we're gonna talk about some of the main components today. Um, and one of the first you know, main component is our pressure reducing valve. So if a pressure reducing station is going to take inlet pressure and reduce it, we need a valve that can do that. And that's our pressure reducing valve. Um, hydraulic control valves are commonly used for this application. Um, we could get into the gist of how, why we use these valves instead of others, but we can do that in other classes. But just safe to say, a hydraulic control valve is the heart of our pressure reducing station. And the way that it works is that it is going to maintain downstream pressure regardless of upstream pressure and regardless of flow rates. So it will open and close in order to maintain a steady downstream pressure. Um, if you're set at 40 PSI, it's gonna open when it starts to drop below 40, it's gonna close when it starts to raise above 40. The way that it does that uh, is with a CRD pressure control pilot. And so that CRD is sensing downstream pressure. And when downstream pressure um, starts to drop, then that CRD is going to start to open, letting water out of the cover, making the main valve open. Conversely, when pressure starts to rise, it will start to close, putting water onto the cover, closing the valve. Um, these pressure reducing valves are really accurate within one PSI, um, and they react really quickly to changes, sometimes too quickly, which is why we'll put a speed control on there to make sure it doesn't overreact. Um, one of the principles though on this valve is that we need 10 PSI of differential. You need 10 PSI more on the inlet than the outlet side. Um, with pressure reducing valves, you know, that's generally the goal, right? Uh, otherwise you wouldn't have a pressure reducing valve, but um, you do need that pressure differential or this valve will not be able to operate correctly. So here's an animation of our pressure reducing valve. So up here, we've got our CRD pilot. Now this pilot is sensing this downstream pressure through this line. It's pushing against this diaphragm and against the spring and the spring is calibrated for our PSIs. This set screw on here pushes down on that spring so that we can create our set point. When we tighten that screw down, it puts more pressure on the spring, which requires more PSI pressure to push it up, opening and closing the valve here. So right here, we can see this valve is feeding this neighborhood. It's about 500 gallons per minute. And oh, now we're dropping down to 400 gallons per minute because we want to maintain a steady downstream pressure. Now upstream pressure is starting to rise. So the valve is going to close to, in order to maintain this downstream pressure. And then flow rates are going to change. The valve is going to change. But the main goal is this downstream pressure. We want to keep that nice and steady. Um, oftentimes, the function of these valves is at night, people aren't using a lot of water. The valve is going to be mostly closed. During the day, people are using lots of water. The valve is going to be mostly open, but it's going to be continuously modulating and changing its position in order to meet that demand. Furthermore, pressure reducing stations are often going to be designed kind of like this picture down here. We're going to have two valves. Um, the reason for that is because of changes in demand. And before I get to that animation, um, just talk a little bit about the changes in demand. So our municipal water systems are set up to uh, keep water around in our cities under different um, use cases and different times of year and different times of day. And usually what that will um, bring it down to is a low and a high demand. So during the night and the winter, oftentimes the demand is very low. During the summer, during the middle of the day, demand will be much higher. Um, during fires, during critical usage, demand can be even higher. And so because of that, there's a wide range of flows that we're feeding with our water systems. And in order to feed those with our clay valve and with other control valves, um, we're going to use two valves. And the beauty of that is that they're going to be sized for their optimum range, and then they're also going to be redundant to one another. So the smaller valve is going to generally feed your lower flows during your nighttime and your during when somebody just flushes their toilet and your larger valve is going to be there for during the day when everybody wakes up, turns on their you know, faucets, turns on their showers, turns on their irrigation systems, 
if there happens to be a fire and a fire hydrant's open, that large valve is there to meet the high demand. The way that the two work together hydraulically is by having different set points. And so this animation here is going to show how these two valves work together. Um, the smaller one's going to be set at a higher set point than, this, than the larger one. So in this example, we've got 65 here and 60 here. During low demand, this valve will maintain 65 PSI downstream. If demand increases, then demand will soon outstrip the ability of that small valve to feed that system. And the valve will go open, but it won't be able to supply enough flow to keep the pressure. When that happens, pressure will still start to drop. And so then the main valve will sense that and it will start to open in order to feed and supplement the flow. And then the two will be working together the flow water and they'll be maintaining 60 PSI. When demand lowers, that larger valve is gonna to start to sense that and it's gonna to start to close, but the small valve is gonna stay open because it's trying to supply 65 PSI. And so that large one will go all the way closed and then our small one will start to close and it will maintain its set point. The two work really well together. We try to size them so that there's a, you know, we've got um, the wide range of flow that's required for the water system, as well as a small overlap between the valves. All right, so beyond pressure reducing valves in our pressure reducing stations, what do we have? Well, one of the next things that is a really important component of the system is isolation valves. So if I have a pressure reducing valve, like a, you know, clay valve 9001, and something goes wrong or I need to do my, you know, ma maintenance on that valve, I need to be able to isolate it. I need to be able to close it off. And so that's where you get like this right here, this butterfly valve or a gate valve or a ball valve that is on the outsides on the inlet and outlet so that we can close down that control valve and be able to open it up and take it apart without spraying water everywhere. Another part in a pressure reducing station is a full line strainer. These are oftentimes like this here, which is an H strainer, or it could also be the Y strainers. Um, and the goal of these is to protect the control valve from getting things in it. So if you have things that get into your water system, like this fish here, um, they can flow pretty well through the girl open pipes. But when they hit a restriction point, such as a control valve, they can get stuck. And if they get stuck inside a control valve, they can make the control valve fail and make it stuck. And usually that makes it fail open. And stuff like this here, you got rocks and debris and a screwdriver. Those can damage the valve as well. And they can cause um, where you need to go out and do maintenance and maybe even have to replace parts. A full line strainer's job is to stop that from happening. And a full line strainer will be able to catch those things and then you can clean out the strainer and not damage your valves. If you have a pressure reducing valve fail open, especially if it's uh, at the top of a hill, that can cause some real issues for your water system, such as this here, where you get overpressurization and you can get failure, explosive failure. And so we wanna keep that from happening. So full line strainers are um, an important part of a pressure reducing station. The X43H strainer for, uh, that is available from clay valve can be put right onto, your clay, um, right onto the front of your clay valve. They're um, really nice and easy to clean out. We talked to a lot of water districts that really like them because um, the opening is right at waist height, right by your clay valve. So when you're doing maintenance, it's really easy to just open it up and clean it out. All right, so beyond full line strainers, let's talk about some other components that are in a pressure reducing station. Um, another one would be an air valve. Um, so we're not gonna get a lot into air valves today. That is a whole nother class. That's you know an hour of discussion of how these work, but the basic premise is that you get water into your um, pipeline system through startup and through entrapped air that's inside water. That water needs somewhere to go. And oftentimes it'll get pushed out out of your faucet or out of your um, hose and that's great. Sometimes it gets stuck in your pipeline system. And if it gets stuck, especially at high points, it can create um, a air bubble that can cut off flow, it can cause surges, and it can cause wear and tear on your pipeline system because it can cause corrosion. And so we want to get that air out. And that's where air release valves, um, what they do. They release air out of your system continuously while you're operating. In addition, we also have air valves that are vacuum protection valves. And that's what that means is that if you um, have a fast movement of water. Say you have a hill and a line breaks at the bottom of the hill and water starts to gush out. When water gushes out and then water 
is slow to take a spot or doesn't, you can get vacuum conditions forming in your pipeline system. Um, pipes are designed to withstand a lot of outward force and, or, and a lot of inward pressure. They're not made to really sustain a vacuum. Um, that's not one of their strengths is that if there's negative pressure, it can collapse. And if you have collapsing pipeline, that's catastrophic. You have to replace it all. And so air valves, you know, they serve those different functions between continuous air release as well as vacuum protection. And there's something that we include in most of our pressure using stations because pressure using stations are generally at a high point in your line. They're at an elevation point. In addition, your control valve as it's constricting flow creates the conditions where entrapped air becomes air bubbles and comes out of the water. And so an air valve, an air release valve, and oftentimes an air vacuum valve is a really nice um, feature to a pressure reducing station to help increase um, the resiliency of your system. All right, another thing inside a pressure reducing station would be a relief valve. So a relief valve is a hydraulic control valve, kind of like our pressure reducing valve, but instead of reducing pressure, this valve is meant to relieve over pressurization. And so the way that they're used is they're put on a T off of the system and then they go to usually atmosphere, sometimes back um, to waste, and they are meant to open up if pressure gets too high in the main line. So if our clay valve is servicing water, somebody opens up a fire hydrant, the clay valve opens up to supply that water, somebody slams that fire hydrant closed, now you're going to get overpressurization and water shock water hammer, that relief valve can open to relieve that overpressurization as your clay valve, your pressure reducing valve goes closed. Um, one of the things about a pressure reducing valve is that it can close to cut off upstream high pressure, but once the pressure downstream has risen to higher than its set point, all it can do is close. Can't do anything else. Um, if it opens, it'll just let more pressure in. There has to be a way of escape. And so a relief valve, um, provides that really quick way of escape. Um, the other way of escape is through usage, through people using their water. Here we can see an animation where we're, we've got a water blind going to this little uh, box city here. We're flowing water. Pressure is meant to be at 35. We're going to set the CRL at 60 so that it's above normal operating. When pressure gets higher than 60, this valve is going to start to open in order to relieve that pressure this valve modulates. It only opens enough to relieve pressure to its set point. It's not gonna fully open draining your system. It's just relieving the excess pressure in order to maintain 60 PSI in the main line. It'll modulate its flow in order to maintain that. And then once pressure drops below its set point, the valve will go back closed and system will be operating as normal. The way it does that is through, we'll watch this animation one more, once more, is through this um, CRL pilot and the CRL pilot is sensing upstream pressure through the, sent, through the pilot tubing. And then it's pushing against a diaphragm and another spring. The spring is calibrated for what our set point should be. And then if pressure is more than that, it'll push upwards, opening up this valve, letting water out of the cover, opening up our main cover. When pressure drops below our set point, the spring will be stronger and it'll push close, closing this valve pushing water into our cover and closing the valve. All right, and then the final thing that goes in most pressure reducing station is all our piping, a vault or enclosure, something to keep it in, um, whether it's underground or above ground. Um, and then, you know, you got your ladder and all your other miscellaneous pieces. Um, we're not gonna talk too much today. There are other things that you can add to your pressure reducing station. Uh, like if you had a booster pump in there or if you have, you know, a chlorine tester or something like that, those are kind of far and few and in between. This is our standard components of a pressure reducing station. And it can look something like that with the drawing where we've got, you know, this little piping and drawing and the vaults in there. And, you know, this is a pressure reducing station that is pre-manufactured and ready to be just dropped in and put into the line. But if it's built on site, your um, specs and your drawings will look very similar. All right, so now let's talk. Now that we've talked about what a pressure reducing station is and the different components about it, let's talk about how to build a smart pressure reducing station. Um, and not, you know, not those dumb pressure reducing stations. And to build a smart pressure reducing station, the first thing that you want to do is include all of the necessary components for that station to work well. 
So if you need a pressure reducing valve, that's what you need for your pressure reducing station. You should include pressure reducing, you know, isolation valves, your bypass if necessary for your flows, um, your full line strainer to help protect the valve, especially if you, if you have things in your water system, um, an air valve, specifically if you're at a high point or if it's a hill and there's a vacuum conditions and a relief valve. So all those things there are really smart to include in a pressure reducing station. Um, this, this valve right here, I'm not gonna say it's done pressure reducing station, but it's not a smart one. Um, you know, if that valve has an issue, what are you gonna do? You're gonna have to go find isolation valves somewhere in the system in order to isolate it. And then to get in there and fix it, I mean, what are you gonna do? I, you know, we wanna make sure we make room for regular maintenance and inspection. So that valve right there, you know, what are you going to do? Stand on your head to get in there? And um, I think after this, do you bury it again? Um, do you put a cover like cardboard box? I mean, this is this is not something that's going to stand up very well to um, you know long term service. So that's where we want to include all of our necessary things to make our pressure reducing station um, a robust, well serviced station. In addition, we're going to talk a little bit about how to build a smart pressure reducing station. And I put that in italics because, you know, this isn't necessarily that it's dumb if it doesn't have this. But when we're talking about smart in this context, we're talking about using technology to improve the functionality of the station. Um, there we have our college educated control valve. Um, <laughs> doesn't make it smart. No, we're talking about using technology to improve and to improve the functionality. And some of the main ways that we can do that is through data, communication, power, control, and versatility. We're gonna go through each of those real quickly and kind of talk about some of the options available to make our stations more functional. And the first one is data. So these pressure reducing stations are made to reduce pressure in our system. And that is, they do their job really well, but they are also an excellent point for collecting data on your water system. So pressure reducing stations are throughout your system separating zones at key points which is a really good spot to collect that data. And some of the things that we can do is we can collect downstream pressure. So if our pressure reducing is, valve is set to maintain 40 PSI, is it always maintaining 40? Are we having fluctuations? Are there small surges? Are we getting periods where pressure is rising at night because nobody's using water and there's no release for the pressure? Um, those are all really good things to know. So we can put a pressure transmitter to record that downstream pressure. And that would be like right there, a little pressure transmitter goes right into the pilot system is gonna record that downstream pressure. Um, our little pressure transmitter is available. You can put, we can have them put right into the pilot system. Um, you know, they work really well. You can also use, you know, any myriad of different products like um, smart sensors and, you know, pressure transmitters that go into the line. You know, this is just what's available that we can put right onto the clay valve. Um, in addition to downstream pressure, we can also collect upstream pressure. So a pressure reducing valve is maintaining downstream pressure regardless of what upstream pressure is, but it might be really good to know what happens to our upstream pressure during the day. Like if demand increases during the day, what happens to our up upstream pressure? Is it sufficient or do we need to make sure maybe to preserve that, put a sustaining pilot on or something? And so we can put another little pressure transmitter on the upstream side. So we have upstream and downstream. In addition, valve position can also be useful information to know where is our valve. Um, is it open all the time? Is it closed a lot? Is it kind of fluctuating a lot? And so we can put a position transmitter on top of the valve. Um, the position transmitter, like this X117, connects to the stem of the valve. And as the stem moves up and down, it moves this whole piece, pulling that line up and down and giving us a 4 to 20 milliamp output of where the valve is at. Um, really accurate, easy to put on the top. Um, you know, 0.015% scale accurate, you know, it's IP68 sealed. So we use these all the time, especially with flow control valves. And this here is an animation where we're going to see, you know, this is that same animation of the hydral valve, but now we can see that X117 on top and how it's just connected to the stem. And when the stem moves, then that pulls, that moves this whole apparatus, which pulls the line out so that we can sense how open the valve is by how much of that line is pulled out. All right, so downstream pressure, upstream pressure, valve position, what other data can we get from a PRV? Anybody, anybody? 
oh yeah, this isn't live. Ah, the other one, which is a big one that I know a lot of people are really interested in is flow. So pressure reducing valves, they just manipulate flow in order to maintain pressure, but it is really useful to know where water is going in our systems. So collecting flow at our pressure reducing stations is really, um, really useful. We can do that a couple different ways. Um, one of the ways that we can do that is through differential flow metering. Differential flow metering is we're going to take these components right here and we're going to calculate what the flow is. And the way that we do that is we're going to use upstream and downstream pressures and calculate what's the difference, the valve position, and then our valve controller has all of our curves from data and testing downloaded into it so that we know if I have 60 PSI upstream, 20 PSI downstream with an eight inch control valve that's 35 and a half percent open, how much flow that equals. Because we know the variables on the inlet and the outlet, how much pressure differential, and we know how open it is, then we know how much water is gonna push through it. And it is very accurate. And it is something that can be added to any control valve to be able to monitor the flows for the valve. Um, in addition, we can do a, um, oh, and there we go, we're connecting all that data. And so we call these our 133 series. Um, it's something that we can add. It's really, really useful. Another way to do flow is that we can do an insertion flow meter. So we have a flow meter that can plug right into the hydral valve on the upstream and it can read the flow through the hydral valve. Um, it's our X144. It is um, fairly accurate, pretty inexpensive, something that you can add in. You don't need any extra fittings or anything. It can go right into your control valve. Your pressure reducing valves can become flow monitoring valves as well. All right, so now we talked a little bit about data, what kind of data we're gonna collect from that. Now that, that's all great and stuff, but we need to be able to communicate that. So if we know what our pressures and flows are, how do we know that? Somebody needs to tell us, we need to be communicated to. And so we can do that a couple different ways. Um, the most basic way would be to do data logging. So your pressure reducing valve has, you know, pressure transmitters and a flow meter on it. And it's just gonna record that data into a, you know, our controller can do it. You can buy a lot of different things, just a data logger. And, you know, once a week or once a day or once a month, you go out there, download the data, plug it in, analyze it, see, oh, wow, last Tuesday we had, you know, kind of an overpressurization and a surge, what happened? And let's look at our other data and see what happened at the same time. So that's one of the more basic ways to do it. Another way would be to do live monitoring. So that would be SCADA integration so that we can see where our valves are at live and we can record that and log it, but we can also see it. So, you know, at any moment you can look around and see where is my water flowing? Um, where, what are my pressures at? And so that can be done with our pressure reducing valves that can give us a really good picture of how our water system is operating. Um, our VC22D valve controller has communication capabilities and data logging capabilities in it. It also is what will be needed for doing differential flow metering. So it's something that can be added to a pressure reducing valve to give you that data logging as well as the communication aspect. Pretty self-explanatory there. Um, we can build it into panels. You can put it on itself. Um, you can also just hardwire your valve into SCADA systems. Um, you know, all those things are options. So this would be an example of if you have a flow control valve that's you know, you're integrating the flow data and your solenoids for this valve to be able to control the flow. And then it's connecting into your SCADA system hardwired in. It can also be Modbus connection in. All right, so we talked about data logging, SCADA integration, direct connection with SCADA would be the last one. We're just gonna plug everything in directly, especially if you're really close to a pump house or something, and that can work. Um, you could also integrate it with the pump logic controller if you do have, you know, a pump house nearby. Another option that we've seen and it's becoming more and more popular as technology is improving is kind of cellular and radio relay devices. So you plug that onto your valve so that the valve is recording data and then it's sending that remotely to your SCADA system. All right, so we talked about data and communication. The next one is power, because this is a big hurdle. Um, you know, our pressure reducing stations generally are in remote places. Um, and sometimes you don't have a power connection close by, you can't connect to the grid. Um, if you can, that, that's a great way to go. Sometimes it's cost prohibitive. And so we do have options available now to be able to get power 
to your pressure using station. And the way that we do that is through micro power generation. So a small turbine on your control valve. And the way that they work is we've got two different options between a, a small micro one and an intermediate power one. And both of them will plug onto your valve and create a bypass around the valve. And water will flow through that bypass, turning the turbine, generating power to charge a battery in order to power communication devices and um, transmitters, um, precision transmitters, data, you know, flow meters, those kind of things. So the small little micro ones can be installed alone or two in a bypass arrangement, and they generate between 0.39 and 0.75 watts. They flow 1.6 gallons per minute for each around the valve, and you need 8.75 um, PSI differential. So for a standard pressure reducing valve, that's pretty easy to achieve. And these here can power a couple pressure transmitters, maybe a flow meter and a data logger. Um, you're not gonna be able to do a lot beyond that, um, especially if you only have you know, one or two. For more power, we're gonna need our intermediate power generator. This here, same system, where we're gonna flow water around the valve, but we're gonna flow um, 15 gallons per minute. And we need 12 PSI differential, and that will generate the power to power this battery pack. Um, with this system here, it also has where it'll automatically shut down the generator when the battery is full. So it helps elong elongate the life of that generator. And this can power some more control. So we could power a motorized controller or we can power you know, a flow meter with some solenoids. And so you can do 14 watts of power continuous. Um, I think it's about 45 for non-continuous draw. And here's an example where this is a pressure reducing valve and it has a flow meter on it. And there's a pressure transmitter upstream on the pipe there. And it's got our intermediate power generator so that it can, this power generator here is powering this battery pack, which is powering this flow meter pressure transmitters so that we can monitor that data. And this is giving us that data capability, data logging without having to connect to the mainline grid. The next thing beyond this data and communication and power is control this would be remotely controlling our valves. So a general pressure reducing valve, you're gonna set the set point with the spring physically, walk away and the valve is gonna maintain that set point. It's not telling you what it's doing. It doesn't care about upstream or flow. It's just gonna maintain that set point based on its hydraulic system. If you wanna change that, you're gonna to have to go down there and get in that vault and change that set screw. Um, a way to make this valve a little bit smarter would be to add a motorized pilot. So we're going to take our same pilot, but put a motorized motor on it so that we can change that set point on this on the spring. You know, this is our 35-4 series of electronic pilot controls where it's taking the same body, but adding a motor on top of it. Um, these are really useful because it's the same proven technology. If you lose power, it just operates in its last position as its normal pilot but you can also remotely change it. So if you wanna change your set point for night and day, you can do it with one of these pilots. If you wanna change your set points based on the season, no need to go to the vault, just change it electronically and it'll send it to this and it'll adjust the tension on the spring. It takes a 420 milliamp signal. We can connect it through Modbus. Um, it can, integrates with our controller, the VC22D. Uh, it uses, you know, low power, it's submergible, and so you can use it with an intermediate power generator to be able to control the valve. Really um, a useful little series of pilots. All right, now beyond that little motorized pilot, that motorized pilot is still working as a hydraulic pilot. So I can change the set point on my pressure reducing motorized CD CRD34, but it's never going to be a pressure sustaining pilot. It's never going to be a flow control pilot. It's still just sensing downstream pressure and controlling for that. If we want to get beyond that, we need to get some solenoids in there. So a dual solenoid setup, setup like this here is a Swiss Army knife of electronic pilot controls. So this valve here can do just about anything. Um, the way that it works is through solenoids. And solenoids are coils that when you put an electric current through it become magnets. So by putting power and taking power away, you can create a magnet on and off. And we use that with our pilots to be able to open and close our pilot system. 
And so they're used all the time. They've been used for years. Um, they're used in a lot of different things, but you know, solenoid pilots in the control system allow us to be able to control the valve by sending electric electricity to those solenoids. And a usual way would be like these two-way actings here as a spring is pushing that it closed. We energize it to magnetize the coil, pulling that piece of metal up, opening up the flow. If we put one of these on the inlet um, piloting system to our control valve, then we open it up, we put water into the cover, we start to close our valve. Put another one on the outlet side, open it up, we let water off the pilot, we start to open the valve. And so we can do that with these two pilots here on this 131 setup where water energize this one to put water to close the valve, energize this one to take water off to open the valve. Um, we would um, burst these. You don't just open them and keep them open. You send a little electric signal to close the valve a little bit. Then you want to open it a little bit and then close it a little bit and then open it a little bit. And so we can use this to control the valve and modulate the valve and make it hold positions. Really, really useful. This setup here, we're going to fail in last position. So if we lose power, it's just going to stay where it is. We can also have this type of setup where it, we energize to close the inlet side. And so that this will fail, whoops, this will fail closed when we lose power. So these solenoid valves um, are really useful because we can do a lot of different things with them. We can do pressure reducing, we can do pressure sustaining, we can do flow control, we can do level control. Really, really useful valves. Um, we do a class on electronic controls where we get into these a lot more and do and hybrid control systems as well. But all that to say, this is a way to make our pressure reducing stations smart where we can change our set points and we can control for multiple things. If we're already collecting data for flow and for upstream pressure, now this pressure using station has become a flow control and a pressure sustaining station if we want it to be. In addition is hybrid systems. So I kind of mentioned that this is where we're gonna have solenoids and hydraulic pilots so that we can make sure the valve operates when it needs to operate. If we lose power, it can revert to hydraulic control and it stays as a pressure using valve. We still have, we have power and we can control it electronically. Hydraulic override and solenoid selected are the two ways that the pilot systems interact with each other. We're not going to get into that today. I'm, I'm going to move on beyond that. So this is all about how this valve right here would work. And we're going to, we would talk about this in our um, electronic control valves class and this one as well. Fun stuff. All right, let's talk a little bit about versatility. So a smart pressure reducing station, we're going to make it more versatile. So a standard pressure reducing station is going to maintain downstream pressure, reacting to changes in order to open and close the valve, manipulating flows. Doesn't care about what the flow is, though. If you have a line break downstream, pressure reducing valve sees pressure start to drop, that boy is going to open wide up, supplying the flow. That might not be what you want. Uh, you have an earthquake, this valve doesn't know that, doesn't care, just cares about downstream pressure doesn't care about upstream pressure either. So if we have a lot of people using water downstream and this thing starts to open to feed that pressure and you start to lose upstream pressure, this valve doesn't care. Um, it doesn't have a pilot to sense that. So that would be something that we might want to fix. Uh, they supply line breaks, kind of mentioned that, and they will drain reservoirs to maintain downstream pressure. So that's a pressure reducing valve. They work really well, but they are limited in their scope. They're not very versatile. When we add electronics, when we add more pilots, when we add all the sensing collecting to our pressure reducing valve, now it becomes pressure reducing as well as pressure sustaining, as well as flow control, as well as level control. Um, if we have reservoir levels upstream and we can set those to be able to turn over our valve with our pressure reducing valves and maintain um, levels. It also um, can help you do assisting condition monitoring. So you can see, you know, it, are my flows going way up? our, you know, my pressure is going all over the place. And so they take our valves, our pressure reducing valves from being reactive, just to reacting to what happens, to being proactive, where we can exert control over the water system and help balance it out. And one of the prime reasons that we're seeing more and more demand for that is because as water systems grow, things are added onto it. It started out, you know, like this, and it was developed really well, but now we've added something over here and 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 different people at different times have done that. Now the whole system together, uh, it wasn't really designed um, to work together very well sometimes. Um, sometimes you run into issues where the system's not balanced. And so 
having these smart controls can allow us to exert more power and influence in order to balance the system out um, and balance out you know frankenstein water system <laughs> and so that's where we're seeing more and more demand for that you know leveling out those flows for system efficiency um, helping improve water quality by eliminating dead zones and making water turnover also gives us early warning and reaction to leaks and so that we can isolate those leaks and be able to go and fix it it also um, gives us that ability to monitor those pressures and flows and seismic you know, reaction. We're seeing more and more that where a water district wants to be able to supply water for a fire. If we have an earthquake and lines break and we drain our reservoirs, we no longer have the water to supply to fight for a fire. So if there's an earthquake, maybe we wanna shut down our valves until we know everything's okay. All right, a couple other little things that can make these valves smart would be our X43 strainer, we can put a differential switch on there to know if it's gotten clogged or not based on the pressure differential across it. Give you a little connection to SCADA, send you a signal, say, oh, we were experiencing high pressure differential on this strainer. There might be something clogging it. Um, another thing would be to put limit switches on our relief valves. So a relief valve opens and then it'll close if the pressurization has ended. Maybe we wanna know if that happens. We wanna know if there's an overpressurization, we can put a limit switch on there, sends us a signal that your relief valve opens last night, something happened. Water quality monitoring. So there's other things that we, you know, other companies do um, where you can monitor chlorine levels or water temperature or um, midi chlorians. <laughs> I think I added this in as a joke for some engineers that I was training. Um, if you're not familiar, media chlorians are, uh, from George Lucas's Star Wars episode uh, one, where they're talking about how Jedi's uh, use the force, uh, it's because of their midichlorian count. So uh, you can ignore that if you want to. All right. So all this to say, this whole class here is, I don't want to be, be saying that you have to do all this stuff to make your valve smart. Um, sometimes you want to start out small and just add a couple things to your valves. Um, we've seen that across the, you know, our territory is that some water districts, they're going to start out with some simple features like, I just want to collect data on what my pressures are. I don't want to do all this electronic control and power generation. I just want to collect the data so that I know what's going on in my system. Or maybe I just want to, you know, collect data on my flow. I just want to put a flow meter in here and record what the flows are so that I know what my system is doing and I can build more accurate hydraulic models. Maybe I just want to monitor for leaks. I just want to know if flow is exceeding a certain amount and that's kind of a warning sign. Sometimes you can just add a motorized pilot and make it a simple two step. During the day, pressure is a little bit higher. At night, pressure is a little bit lower. Or winter, pressure is a little bit lower. Or summer, pressure is a little bit higher just kind of a simple. And then also sometimes you can just add a single solenoid to a pressure using valve so that you can remotely shut down the valve so that it's normally just a pressure using valve. But if I send a signal, I'll lock in a, a latching solenoid and I'll close my valve. So some of those things that you can do just simply to help build functionality into your pressure using stations and you don't have to go you know, full electronics. And oftentimes too, what we see is that you don't need full electronic smart controls on every single pressure using station. Maybe there's just one or two critical stations that you wanna be able to control the flows and then the rest of them could be set hydraulically to be able to follow those. So that by controlling one or two, you're controlling your system. And this is also really common. All right, for just the last couple of minutes, let's look at how to keep control valves from failing. So first thing to do is maintenance. <laughs> so maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. You know, well-maintained control valve runs really well for a long time. But control valves are kind of like a car. You don't drive a car for 50,000 miles without expecting to change the oil or check, you know, your fluid levels or take it in to get the brakes checked. You know, you need to do periodic maintenance. Same thing with our control valves. So, you know, every control valve manufacturer has their own recommendations. The industry standards are an annual inspection, check it every year, make sure it's looking good, make sure it's working well. And then every five, you know, three to five years, you're going to do a rebuild. So the rubber parts inside of the valve need to be changed out for new rubber parts and then signs for wear need to be checked. And then any parts that are showing excessive wear needs to be changed out. That right there will eliminate most of the failures that we see with control valves. Uh, most of the failures we see are people that have had a control valve in the ground for 20 years without anybody touching it. 
thing, you know, it worked for 20 years, which is great, but it is prone to now fail. Another thing to do um, to keep our control valves operating smoothly is to put some epoxy coating on those valves. So nice shiny blue not only makes it look pretty, but it helps protect the internals of the valve. Uh, clay valve gives you the option of choice. So if you don't say so, it could be not epoxy coated. And you know, the majority of valves that we manufacture and sell are epoxy coated. And so, you know, it's just a really simple addition to make sure your valve is protected. But if you're an irrigation district that's rebuilding your valves every year and cleaning them out, maybe you don't need them epoxy coated. Another thing would be if you're having issues to upgrade the strainers for the pilot system. So our standard strainers, uh, you know, they work well, but if they get clogged, that can cause water not to move on and off the pilot, which can cause some issues. So we have different options um, that you can do, um, progressive options, and you know, give us a call if you have an application like that, and we can try to give you the right solution. Another would be to upgrade the internal material. So brass is standard, but stainless steel is really common. So that's the disc guide, the seat, and the cover bearing. Um, we see that often. Another option would be the stem. So a DuraClean stem is fluted in order to keep it from getting buildup on it. Sometimes the water can cause calcium buildup. If you have a valve that's not operating very often, that can cause it to get stuck. DuraClean stem is a great option. And then finally, upgrading your pilot system material. So maybe uh, stainless steel tubing and fitting or a stainless steel pilot. Uh, this is, you know, we see, we're seeing more and more of it. Uh, we're seeing more and more, especially with the prices of stainless steel coming down comparatively to other materials, uh, this is becoming a better and better option. And then additional pilots. So we can take, you know, we can add electronic controls or we can add hydraulic controls. So something really similar would be like a 9401. This valve is controlling pressure downstream and it's also controlling for surges. If downstream pressure rises, above what the set point is for the pressure reducing valve by a certain amount, then our secondary pilot will close the valve. Um, this is meant for if you have a surge scenario where pressure rises really rapidly downstream that this second valve will help the valve close even quicker. It is also really useful because if you have a failure with your primary pilot or strainer, the secondary pilot can help catch that and keep the valve from failing open. Pressure sustaining would be another option for this in 92 series where we have a pressure sustaining pilot on there as well. So we're looking at upstream pressure. We could also do combination, you know, solenoid override, flow control, a lot of different things hydraulically. So these are really fun things. We love to solve these different puzzles. And that concludes um, our class for today. So thank you guys so much for attending. Um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. And um, I think my camera here is there we go. Here I go. Uh, you know, feel free to give me a call or Steve or our office and we can help you um, with any of your control valve questions or, you know, butterfly valves, bulb valves, check valves, air valves, uh, package pumping stations, safety cover enclosures. Feel free to give us a call. And thank you guys so much um, for taking the time today and have a great uh, rest of your conference.